his name is truly wonderful. Amen? Amen. And it's good to know that we can know him and that we can walk in fellowship with him and have a great time in the Lord. Well, do you know that Ms. June always takes care of our waters? She always has us those little bitty ones. And she, you know, that's what you call helps in the New Testament, gifts. She always has my water. So y'all, after the last incident, I had to go get a big one. So I don't know what's going to happen now. But I'm going to take a sip off of it, and I'm going to tighten the top real good. Mm. But there you go. So I'm just going to lay it like that, kind of keep it over out of the way. We don't need to have another, another one of those, do we? The water goes everywhere, I tell you. But um, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Good to be able to see everybody that's here this morning, and I hope and pray that you've had a, a good week in the Lord. But we're going to continue that series of messages through 1 Timothy. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy. Uh, many of you know that here in 1 Timothy, we have been talking primarily about the church setting, and we've also dealt with the fact of church order. And there's been a lot of things that we've dealt with concerning the beginning of a New Testament church. But this morning, as we look here in the book of Timothy, particularly in chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 in chapter 4. But what we will find here is the pastoral setting and how that the Apostle Paul gives Timothy some great pieces of advice and how it can actually relate to you and me today in the present times in which we're living. Because I believe that what we're going to be glancing at here is vitally important for us to understand in the times in which we're living. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Okay, let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your presence. We're thankful that we can look to your word for divine leadership and guidance. And Father, I pray now as we turn our hearts towards you and as we focus upon your holy word, Father, that you will let your word have its rightful place in our hearts and in our lives. And Father, I just pray now that you'll use these few moments as I surrender this message unto you. May you be honored and glorified. And Father, I just pray that your people will be encouraged and edified today. We just pray now that you'll bless these few moments in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 10, okay? 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to read down through verse 10. Paul writes to young Timothy, and he tells him this. He says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in heresy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to sustain from foods which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving by them who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused. It is to be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Then he moves on and he says, If thou put or put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be of a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, unto which thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness profiteth unto all things, having promise of life that is now and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. When we read this text, we've got to realize the textual setting of where the Apostle Paul is and of what he's about to approach or what he is actually saying 
in this textual setting. Remember this, we have already dealt in chapter 3 with where Paul describes some attributes that need to be found in a pastor, and then he dealt with the attributes that need to be found in the deacon. So he has dealt with what I would call church structure already. And by the time he gets to chapter 4, he's beginning to, t to tell and to say how that we need to be mindful of theological impressions upon people. And when we think about that, it simply means this. We need to think about how we think, what we say theologically. And he's beginning to pursue that both individually, as a church, and also with our theological ideas. So what we have to understand that it is important what we believe theologically personally. And it's also vitally important what we believe theologically as a church. So when you look at this textual setting, Paul is setting the stage for that, particularly now as he moves into chapter 4, which is vitally important. Might we at this time look here in chapter 4 and see what the apostle Paul shares with Timothy as great advice. Now, what we've got to understand here, we know the Apostle Paul, the great man of God, with some attributes of courage and experience, was speaking to young Timothy, and he's trying to help to guide him theologically and for him to understand there are some major influences upon his life in the life of the early church. So he shares with him some major important virtues in this particular text that we've read this morning. And that's what I want us to look at and to make some application out of it in our lives today. One of the first things that we notice in this particular passage that we read is this. The Apostle Paul in verses 1 through 5 gives Timothy a warning. A warning. That's what he does. Listen to what he says in the, in the first part. He says, now... The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. He gives him a warning. He says, I just want you to know, young Timothy, that there are going to be some who depart from the faith, who will waver from good theological concepts. So when we read here, as he warns him about those who are departing from the faith, we need to make some application of it then and bring it to the times in which we're living. So what's so important is simply this. In the first century, the first century church was dealing with a lot of problems, particularly that of Judaism that had crept back into the church, and that's what we're dealing with on Sunday night in the book of Galatians. But what we've got to realize is he says, look, young Timothy, look, there are some who have departed from the faith. And what we've got to realize is simply this, particularly the Judaizers of the first century, which were simply saying that grace was not enough. You had to understand and practice the Old Testament law. Now, let me share something with you today. Let's make a hermeneutical arch to that today. There are some who have departed from the faith which no longer believes that grace is sufficient for salvation. I just want to tell you that. Friends, if grace isn't enough, then it's your works that you're relying upon for your salvation. And that is not New Testament biblical theology. And so what we have to realize is the Judaizers have been begin to, to creep into the first century church. And then lo and behold, not only the Judaizers, but also the worldliness had begun to creep into the life of the church. Because what he was simply saying is there are some that was saying, well, this theology's okay, but they became more liberal in their theology in the first century. So in the first century, we see that there was a great parting of the ways, even in the first century, those who would hold true to solid biblical theology compared to those who were letting certain things infilter the life of the church. Now, we also notice here that the Apostle Paul, in light of this, talks about how that this will happen, particularly at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had two major events, his coming the first time and his coming a second time. And between his first coming and his second coming, you will always have those who will come along with heresy along the way. So when we think about that in that 
sexual, I mean, contextual setting there, we must realize what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us. So we can look at some of the New Testament passages that relate directly to that. Look with me in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, if you would. Matthew chapter 24, and when we look in chapter 24 of the book of Matthew, particularly in verse 11 down through verse 14, watch what the Apostle Paul has to say in regard to the coming of the Lord and how that we need to remain truthful to the Word of God. In verse 11, he says this, And many shall fall away, or many shall be false prophets, that shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now let's pause there for just a moment. Why would Matthew, in this particular chapter, dealing with the end times is what he was talking about? And my friends, there are going to be some in this generation and in the next 20 years that are going to gradually fall away from the church. They've already been falling away from the church. In matter of fact, a more conservative theology that we have, there will be more that will fall away from the church and will look to denominations that are liberal in their theological thinking. So listen to what the Apostle Paul says. I'm going to go back and read this verse and kind of explain, not Paul, but what Matthew is saying, the words of Jesus. Watch what he says. I'm talking about in, in, in these times in which we're living. And many false prophets shall rise. First of all, if you're going to be a real prophet of God, you need to make sure that the man that you're sitting under is a God-called man. Amen. Not a mama's call boy or a denominational call boy. Make sure he's solid in his theology and he knows his salvation and he knows the calling upon his life. So vitally important. So you will have false prophets that shall rise and shall deceive many. The book of James says primarily what we have to do. do you, you know the primary ingredient to being able to test a prophet's words? First of all, are you ready? Are they theologically sound? And second of all, will they last? The test of time. That's so important. So he says here in verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, and the love for many shall grow cold. Now I'm going to stop there for just a moment. I believe we're finding that to be true in the times in which we're living. You know what so many people are finding out right now? That for some reason, that job, that money, that bank, and that car won't love them. For the love of many shall grow cold. Let me tell you something. When you get to a certain age and you realize that relationships are valuable and they're really more important than what we thought was in the journey, we'll begin to wake up some. We really will. So I got news for you. Listen to me carefully. Need to be, you need to be careful in what you are in the pursuit of. Because it may be a cold bedfeller in the future. Got to be careful about that. Okay? So when we look at that, be mindful of that. He says, because the love of many, of many shall go cold. He says, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And then he gives the great proclamation. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall this end come. Wow. The God, you know what that's telling me? It's telling me two things. I think we're getting close to it. People are finding out all around this world that what they have does not make him happy. And you know what? The gospel's being spread all around the world today. 
So turn back with me here to 1 Timothy, okay? 1 Timothy chapter 4. So we see that even in the Gospels, it talks about the coming of Christ and how that some will depart from the faith. And then I like what it says also in 1 John. So if you have your Bibles here, again, turn way back to the back of your Bible, make about three lefts, and you'll run into 1 John. Best way to find it, okay? Turn back there. 1 John chapter uh, 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 through verse 20. And what are we talking about? We're talking about Paul's advice or warning to Timothy. He's given Timothy a warning about how that some shall depart from the faith. In verse 18 of chapter 2 of 1 John, he writes and he says this. John says, little children, it is in the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there some Antichrist, by which we know that this is or at the time of the last days. Now watch what he says here. It's very important. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and that ye know all things. Now, there's some very important things that John says there. You need to look at the, you may need to underline what I'm getting ready to tell you in those little verses. I want you to notice some major aspects here. First of all, he says their departure. That's important. There's a reason for their departure. Remember this, back here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he said they departed from the faith. Listen to me carefully. You will always find those who depart from the faith will eventually depart from the church. That's the second step. When they depart from the faith, they're going to depart from the church. That's the reason once they've departed from the, from the faith, it's hard to ever get them back to the church. Okay? So he says that's what's going to happen. And then he says this. He says basically the reason that they couldn't continue was because of the fact they couldn't agree with theological doctrines. And then he says they went out from us, and watch this. This is important. That they might be made manifest. Do you know what the word manifest means? It means revealed or made known. <laughs> oh, me. Do you know it's always amazing how some theological institutions give them time when they depart from a conservative theological branch, give them time, they will, let, they will, sh they will show what they are. That's what he's saying. He says they will show what they are, that they might be made manifest that in the long run, what? That they were not of us. Wow. He says, but ye have an unction from the Holy One. Now, you know what John basically says is this. He says, you have an internal presence. Of the Holy Spirit, the unction from within. That's what he's saying here. To know what is right and wrong, to know all things. That's what he's saying. The God, the Holy Spirit leads us in that. So when we think about that, we must remember here that young Timothy is being advised by the Apostle Paul to first and foremost to see these warning signs that are present here in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, when we look at that, yes, we have seen that there was some that will depart. But then the second thing that we see here in regard to this, still under the whole aspect of Timothy's warning, is simply this. Paul continues to warn Timothy with a description and a reason for their departure. It's what he does. He says, I'm going to give you now the reasons and the description for their departure, for many of them. And he begins to do that in the remaining part of this segment of Scripture. First of all, he says some will depart by giving heed to seducing spirits. That's what he says here. 
So watch what he says. He says, okay, some are going to depart. We we examined that. He said, but giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Seducing spirits basically means this. It means they have departed with a spirit of error. That's literally what it means in the Greek. He says, look, there are going to be some that are going to depart from you because they have departed in sound biblical theology and they're departing because of an error in their theological understanding of Scripture. So what happened, not only is he saying that, but he says the reason that they've gotten there is because of bad advice and false teachers. You know, (laughs) I don't mean this to offend anybody here. But I've heard people say something like this. I'm going to give you the best example I know how. And I'm not being critical. Don't take this. It's just, it's just as a redneck expression, okay? But I hear some people may sometimes tell me this. Well, I want you to know something. I'm a so-and-so denomination. But I used to be Baptist. And I want to whisper in their ear and say, no, you never were Baptist. I'll give you an example. What about when somebody says, well, I tell you what, I've been around and I'm a Jehovah witness now. But I want you to know I used to be a Baptist. Friends, you never was a Baptist to start with. Amen. Bottom line. Why? Because we believe in biblical sound theology. That's, right. Amen. That's the bottom line. Now, you will hear me say this, and I'll tell you this time and time again. I have brothers and sisters in all kind of other denominations. I know that. I'm not, I'm never the one to say, I'm going to tell you what, if you're not Southern Baptist, you're going to hell. (laughs) I know some that claim to be Southern Baptist is probably headed there. (laughs) Amen. That's right. (laughs) I'm not that crazy. I've been around a block a few times. But what I'm simply saying is, He's trying to say they've completely erred from the truth and they've lost a sound theology. And he was trying to tell them, you need to be mindful of that. You need to be thoughtful of that. And then he moves on and he says this also. He says also not only with seducing spirits, he says in in, in doctrines of demons, and that's a whole other concept to get into there, doctrines of demons. There was an understanding in the first century church now that there were some who were being influenced by the spells and the casting of demon possession. He said, look, they've completely lost it, okay? And then he says also, speaking lies and heresy. And that word lies and heresy basically means that of the Judaizers that had crept in and had an influence in the first century church that was leading people astray with lies and heresy. Now, here's the other thing. Here's another good one. How about if we transpose that to the modern day time? Well, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. When it says speaking lies in heresy, which means falsehood, which could mean liberal theology. Let me tell you something. Folks, some people look at me and say, well, say, what do you know about liberal theology? I know a lot about liberal theology. <laughs> we can sit down and talk about a lot of stuff. And I'm pretty sound, I think, theologically in my understanding of biblical truth talk about a lot of that but liberal theology creeping into the life of the church is where speaking heresy or lies in heresies of liberal theology to the do the excuse me to the degree listen to what it says that it says to that of whether consciousness is seared or seared with a hot iron what in the world does that mean I'm going to tell you the best example I know from a redneck perspective. Okay? (laughs) 
I was raised in a household of six sons with no sister. So when I was coming up, mama made us do girly things because she didn't have a daughter. <laughs> I've scrubbed commodes, washed out sinks, changed clothes. No, 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 you don't mix your colors together and bleach and all of that stuff. She said, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to set you boys down. I don't have a daughter. All I got is boys. Y'all going to learn some things to help around this house. So she taught me some stuff. And guess what? I know how to iron. But that's through experience and some bad experiences, okay? <laughs> My wife will tell you, if I need something ironed, I don't go, I don't go to, baby, I need something ironed. I know what the ironing board is. I get out to iron and I iron my britches or whatever needs to be ironed. And then some of you say, well, I get mine pressed to have mine delivered. That's good. But I save my money and get the starch out and do my own. Okay? But anyway, see, I can put that money on rabbit hunting money. But anyway, <laughs> amen, buy me some more shotgun shells. Buy me another beagle along the way. But anyway, I'm going to tell you where you mess up. So when the iron's too hot, and you put on a pair of britches, and all of a sudden you got a big iron spot sitting right there in front of you. Do you know what you've done? You've ruined them, and you've melted it. And let me tell you something. You know what he's telling me? He's telling me that there are some that have become so liberal in their theology that they have ironed their brain, and it will never be the same again. A bona fide liberal is a liberal. And only God can do a supernatural work to take something that is ironed to where you've messed it up to be able to make it right again. And I found out in my journey in life that you have to be very careful about those who go into the liberal theological concepts because I've got news for you there's a good chance they will never come back. They will stay right in the liberal concepts and the literal views. And we have to understand that he was saying that there were some who were speaking with heresy to, to the degree that their minds were literally branded, melted. The second thing or third thing that he says here we notice is that he also says that they were some that were forbidding to marry. He says, and commanding to abstain from foods. He says, forbidding to marry. Now, when he says that, basically, this was the Gnostic view that all flesh is evil. Now, we've got to remember something. Listen, forbidding to marry. Why? Because all flesh is evil. Now, I, I'm going to say something. The ch little kids are gone, but I'm not going to say a lot. There's nothing wrong with a man desiring a lady. I have a big problem when he desires a man. I got a big problem with that, okay? <laughs> I've got some major theological issues with that. But forbidding to marry for the purpose of making yourself more holy. Now, some say, some were in the New Testament. Listen to me carefully. I, I've read things. I'm not just some ponut guy sitting over on the back of a hillside somewhere. I understand that there were some in the early first century that were saying, don't get married because Christ is going to return. Understand that. But why did it linger all the way to the fourth century? Because by the time the 4th century got there, you had monks in monasteries that were saying, oh no, sustain from marriage. Because we cannot let this force take over us. You will be more real when you have a wife and kids. Kids will make you real. I believe that. Matter of fact, I believe in what the scripture says. I really do. That's right. Because the scripture completely tells us that we're supposed to be married and to have children. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But I'm going to talk about that here just in a little bit. But when he says for, forbidding to marry, that's a whole other concept. Then also, when we think about that, remember this, that what they were saying was that there should be no sexual relationships in a marriage situation because of the fact that you need to be super holy. Everything to do with the body is evil because the Gnostics thought that all flesh and created matter was evil. They would say that wood is evil, anything is evil. And flesh with flesh, that is just totally evil. Really? Is that their theological view? Well, let me share something with you. I'm just going to read a passage of Scripture for you. Are you ready? This is Scripture. I'll tell you where it's at in a moment because I know you'll be listening to me. Listen to what it says. Good passage of Scripture. It says, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, Male and female created he them. Why did he create a male and female? For the purpose of procreation. Listen. Sue and Betty can't have another one. Neither can Stan and Steve. I just had to say that. Verse 28 and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Wow. Now let me share something with you. Is that true right there? Yes, it is. Do you know the primary reason that I said what I said while, just a moment ago before I read the Scripture? Was because of this reason. Nobody is saying what sin is in America today. And it's not even coming from the pulpits either. You know primarily why? <laughs> Here comes my redneck. Because that doesn't own me. God does. He has always supplied my needs, and he expects me to preach the truth regardless of the effect of that. And I know some people say, well, we can control that, brother. Are you ready? I'm going to get real cocky now. If you control that to control me, I can find somewhere else to preach. Whoa. Because God has called me to preach the truth, not to compromise his word based upon my wallet. Now, you know the reason I feel like I could say that, what I just then said? You know why? Because I hadn't been here three years. I haven't been here five years. I've been here 24 years. That's the reason I felt like I could say that. Because you know how you know me. And you know that I haven't been here 24 years that Brother Steve is determined to preach the what? Preach the word of God, the truth. So you know my heart and you know what I said to be truthful. Because I remember when I was a 19-year-old young man, now I'm 58 years old, that the God that called me to preach at 19 is the same God that's left me here today to be the pastor of Caney Court Baptist Church. Amen. Amen? So true. So true. And he's always supplied my needs. <laughs> he says, Steve, you remain faithful and I'll take care of the rest in the journey. And he has. So, so truthful. Then I want you to notice here something else. I want you to notice that he also says that we need to sustain from meats. What in the world is he talking about there? Here was the other thing. Sustaining from certain food in general because they believe that food in itself was material and material is evil. So you sustain from this food and from that food because food is evil, particularly to sustain from meats. Now let me share something with you. I don't have any problem with people who are vegetarians. Matter of fact, I'd probably lose a lot of weight 
if I was a vegetarian because I couldn't have any fried chicken and I'd be in serious trouble. I am going to say one thing. I might be very careful about this. I have a landscape and lawn business and I work hard. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you something. If you have to work hard, 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 you better have some, <laughs> some chicken, some cream potatoes, and some cornbread, buddy, if you're going to work long and you're going to work hard. You know why? I know that from experience. Get out and get to working real hard for about three hours, and I'm about to starve to death. Why? Because I haven't had meat and potatoes. Meat and potatoes and cornbread, buddy, will last you a long time through the day. And some people look at me and they'll say, oh, brother, you don't, I know what I'm talking about. You go shovel hundreds and hundreds of pounds of river rock, mulch, and trim hedges, and do all that kind of work. And I'm going to tell you what, you better be looking for the paddy wagon, most of some good food, amen? I'm telling you. I tell you what, I love salads, but salads go dry in about two hours. Okay? I'm a meat and potato man, and I praise God for this passage of Scripture I'm about to read. <laughs> Amen? Lord, I thank you for this one here, okay? <laughs> Whoo! Lord says, Steve, this is especially just for you, brother. I said, okay, God, thank you. Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. Boy, watch what he says. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat, boy, for you, even as the green herbs have given you all things. Wow. So he tells me that I can eat my salads and my meats as well. But listen to me. There were some that were saying, no, you got to have these special kind of like things to make sure that you're able to survive. And so what we've got to realize is this. He's saying be careful about those who think that you, you just need to live like you were way back in some time of a concept of staying away from meats. Now let me share this with you. Based upon the scripture, it's okay to eat meats. But you don't need to eat the whole chicken when you sit down to eat. Amen? That's right. There's a difference between eating meat and gluttony. Have you ever noticed no preachers ever preach on gluttony? I've never heard a preacher yet preach on gluttony. It's probably because most of us would be the prime example. Correct? That's correct. I know y'all saying he's lost his marbles this morning, but anyway. I also want you to notice something that's very important when we look at this text. It's vitally important. I want you to thirdly notice here in this textual setting that Paul gives Timothy some encouragement. Excuse me, that's the second thing, some encouragement. And we find that in verse 6. In verse 6 he says, If thou put thy brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, unto which thou has attained. And what he's simply saying here is this. He says, Timothy, you have brought people along the way and you have reminded them and you've shared with them the truth in such a way that you are now bringing them in a nurturing way along the way. And it's vitally important that we all encourage one another in a nurturing way. The third thing I want us to notice here is in verses 7 down through verse 10, Paul gives Timothy some advice. And when Paul gives Timothy some advice, we must remember, why would Paul mention these verses, verses 8, I mean 7 and 8, why would he mention those verses? I want you to think about it. He's sitting in a theological concept here. And all of a sudden he brings this up. But refute profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather to godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. First of all, we must remember the culture in which Timothy was facing. A Grecian culture, 
with a lot of liberal views and philosophies and also in the age of the Olympian. We've got to remember that. He says, first of all, he says, refute. And when he says here to refute, that means to decline, to reject, or to make void. Okay? That's what it means, to refute. He says, refute, profane, and old, he says, wise fables. And when he says profane, that means the absence of divine truth. That's profane. And then when he moves to the fact of wives' fables, when he says that there, basically what he was saying was, be careful about being influenced by fiction and falsehood. And I like what also the book of Colossians has to say about that. And listen to what the book of Colossians has to say about it. It says this, he says, Beware lest any man should spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. Wow. So when we see that, we must realize that the wives' tales mean simply this. It means fiction or falsehood at the time. So he's trying to tell him, he says, Timothy, I want to advise you. First of all, refute, which means reject. Those things that are absent of divine character, which are fictional and also falsehood. He said, you must understand, you do not let that creep in. Then, let me ask you a question. Why in the world? I thought about this. I said, where, does, where is he going with this? Think about this. Why would he all of a sudden say, and exercise thyself, rather, to godliness? For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness profits unto all things. Where, let me ask you a question. How does that fit in to this textual setting? Let me ask you a question. Have you been reading something and all of a sudden you say, how does that fit in? And I've read that verse before. But does it really fit into what he's even dealing with? There must have been a reason for him saying that. And there is a reason. Why? Because many of you know, at the Grecian time, there was the Greek culture was very big, and particularly the Greek youth. Timothy was a young what? A young man. Grecian culture was so present that Timothy began to be involved in that. And Paul said, Timothy, you need to be careful about that. That's what he was saying. The cultural movements at the time. And listen to me. He could say anything else in this world. What do you mean? Well, let me ask you a question. What about some of the sports? And what about hunting? And what about fishing? And we could elaborate on that. But he was telling Timothy, young Timothy, listen, don't be called up in the Grecian Olympian culture because of the fact that godliness is more important than that. So here's the thing. That could be anything. What are you and I letting completely dominate our lives to where we lose the spiritual significance of our lives? That could be anything, couldn't it? It really could be. So when we think about that, let's be mindful of this. The Apostle Paul gives advice to Timothy to remain focused on what really matters, the spiritual man. That's what he's trying to tell us. Remain focused on what really matters, the spiritual man. And Paul's words to Timothy involve these three things again, a warning, encouragement, and advice. That's what he gave. How might you and I today relate to what we've heard this morning and make it applicable to our own personal lives? What are some warnings that God is giving us individually, personally? How and in what way is God trying to encourage us like Timothy was being encouraged? And what advice is God wanting us to receive 
that Timothy was needing to receive. Think about that. Advice to young Timothy could be advice that we need today. Would you bow your heads, please? With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. Maybe a few concluding questions, simple questions. First one is, what are you dealing with in your life today where you need some spiritual help and spiritual guidance? What are you walking through? What are you dealing with? And then maybe another question might be, is there some decision that you need to make? A decision. You know, maybe God has spoken to your heart in a way that goes beyond the eyes of men today, in a way that he is wanting you to walk closer with him and to exemplify him in a powerful way. Father, I pray this morning if there's any decisions that need to be made, there may be some that need to come to the altar and pray. There may be some that just need to encourage and edify one another. There may be some that even want to unite with Caney for it. My prayer, Father, is whatever you're leading individuals to do in the life of this church, that you'll have your way and your will, Father. Bless these few moments now, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.